So which one of you is named Sean? It must be you, because you plainly are mischievous. Maybe you. Hi, I'm Melanie, and you're watching Yarn Journeys. Um, on this channel, I share with you my journeys into the fiber arts, both near and far from home. Uh, this is my uh, second ever episode. So uh, those of you who are returning to my channel, having watched the first episode, thanks so much for coming back. And those of you who have found my channel for the very first time, uh, thanks for watching. I am so glad to have you here. So this is also the second of a three-part series about uh, my trip to Ireland this past spring. Uh, my husband and I spent four weeks traveling Ireland's Wild Atlantic Way, which is a sort of official route that begins in the southernmost part of Ireland in County Cork and goes all the way up to the most northern part in County Donegal. Uh, today's episode is going to focus mostly on our travels through County Kerry and County Clare. Uh, so here's the lineup for today. So first, uh, I'm going to actually be returning to County Cork to show you Bantry Yarns, uh, a great little yarn shop. Um, I'm also going to be showing uh, more footage of those cute little lambs uh, that are all over Ireland in springtime. Uh, I, I couldn't get enough of them. Uh, then, uh, going to um, visit uh, Kerry Woolen Mills and actually an outlet of Kerry Woolen Mills in Dingle. Uh, I'll be showing you some wonderful scenery that we saw on our trip. Of course, there's also going to be some show and tell of finished objects and works in progress. Bantry Yarns is a small cozy yarn shop in, well, the town of Bantry in West Cork. Uh, it has everything you could possibly want to be able to knit any pattern. Uh, the yarn selection in that small space was quite stupendous. I mean, from the floorboards all the way to the ceiling, uh, there were shells and shells of a fantastic selection of yarn. So I saw yarns of all weights from lace all the way up to chunky and bulky and of a great array of fibers wool silk cotton acrylic mohair um, and there was also boucle and you know it was really uh, fun to peruse the shelves of that store uh, the owner is actually an australian expat and you know as we got to talking i was like that accent isn't Irish. Um, and she's actually from Adelaide and has a great knowledge and understanding of wool from her time in Australia, which as you know, is you know a major exporter of Merino. Um, so, you know, we had a, a really good conversation about why Irish wool isn't as popular as I thought it should be. You know, I'd been driving around the countryside and there was, well, sheep everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, it was surprising to me that, you know, at least back in the U.S., I hadn't really, you know, heard that much about Irish wool in comparison to, say, um, Scottish wool or uh, wool from New Zealand or even South America. So, you know, she, um, she explained that she thought it was because Irish wool is actually, you know, fairly long staple. It's not that soft and it may actually be difficult to spin. So, you know, a lot of people don't want that next to their skin. And so it's, you know, a bit rough to a world that's gotten used to, you know, soft and squishy merino. And as well, also that maybe the mills wouldn't want to deal with that uh, uh, scratchy long staple wool. Um, and then I got to thinking, I was like, 
gee, you know, Icelandic wool is, you know, can be fairly scratchy. Uh, I've definitely got some scratchy wool when I was in Iceland last year. And, you know, it's quite popular. And then you should like, huh, come to think of it, I get requests all the time for let lopi. Um, and so then we had a fun conversation about how perhaps, you know, Iceland has done a great job at uh, marketing, you know, that wacky Icelandic wool, which is quite scratchy um, compared to what's going on in Ireland. But anyway, I, this is a thread that I began to really uh, look into. In any case, um, Bantry Yarns has a, um, a great selection of Irish wool, um, particularly those uh, from uh, Donegal Yarns and Studio Donegal, uh, which is one of the major yarn producers in Ireland. And it also had a wonderful selection of Life in the Long Grass. Now, I spoke about Life in the Long Grass in the last episode. Uh, it's a, a dyer that comes from West Cork, and uh, you know if you look on their website, they uh, talk about their values. It's it's really important for them to work with eth ethically sourced yarn um, and wool, which you know to them is sort of wool. If it's merino, it's it's wool that is musling free. Uh, if it's superwash, uh, it's made in one of the newer superwash um, processes that is easier on the environment. Uh, they use, wherever possible, natural dyes or at least non-toxic dyes. And I got these, um, I got two skeins of their Highland DK, uh, and these are hand dyed, um, and they're just beautiful colors. Uh, I love the way that there's a lot of variegation in this sort of, uh, it's not quite brown, but it's not quite burgundy. It's just, I think it's gonna be beautiful, knit together with this pink, uh, which you know i think maybe that could be a hat but anyway this is how uh, life in the long grass uh, describes um, their highland dk it's a mixture of corydale and merino wool completely untreated and sourced from sheep who roam the peruvian highlands making a durable woolly fabric it is spun by the mill to support local farmers and to promote sustainability in the region 100% untreated Highland wool. Uh, and then it says on the back of the um, label, ethically sourced yarn, recycled paper and packaging, colors inspired by nature, hand dyed in our studio in rural Ireland. So it clearly they take pride in making yarn uh, with uh, their values in mind. But they also put out um, a magazine and uh, this is just a beautiful book. Uh, there are um, amazing pictures of the West Cork uh, landscape. Um, you know, they have, of course, uh, patterns and, um, you know, recipes, uh, poetry, I don't know if you can see that. So it, this is definitely, uh, I, I, I enjoy getting this book and reading through it and I feel it's very inspiring. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we were in Ireland in the spring, which is of course lambing season. So there was cuteness everywhere to see as we were driving through the countryside. Uh, the lambs that you saw in the clip earlier in the episode, they were actually bottle lambs um, and they were in a pen uh, next to a coffee stand that uh, the farmers had put up. Uh, the, the coffee stand was near the Steig Fort, which is 
uh, stone fort that's several centuries old and the farms kind of surrounds it. So, uh, you know, the farmers, as they were manning the, the coffee stand with scones and yummy coffee, uh, also needed to make sure that these bottle lambs were taken care of. So uh, funny enough, the farmers were also from Philadelphia and they had inherited their farm from uh, an Irish grandmother. But in any case, uh, those little lambs were quite adorable. And then later when we got to Dingle, uh, just outside of the window of our room in our B&B, there was a large sheep pasture. So of course I was endlessly fascinated staring at the, out at the windows as the um, lambs nursed at their ewes and played and so forth. Uh, you know, it was it was a lot of fun to just watch them bounce around, and uh, they particularly like to race each other. Uh, so, uh, you know, I it was just so just gave me such joy to see those baby lambs. Now, of course, I tried not to think about where those lambs went once they grew up, but it it, it is awfully cute. The next shop I visited was an outlet of the Cary Woolen Mills in Dingle. Now I call it an outlet because Cary Woolen Mills is actually in uh, Killarney and it's a 300 year old woolen mill. Uh, the shop I visited mainly had items directed towards tourists. Now everything was either made at the Kerry Woolen Mill or was made from yarn that was milled at Kerry Woolen Mills, but uh, it wasn't at the actual mill itself. So inside there were, you know, all sorts of woolens. Of course you had knitted things like cable knit sweaters. Uh, there were lots of tweed, so, you know, tweed vests, tweed jackets, tweed hats. Uh, and uh, they also had some yarn for sale. Um, there wasn't a huge selection uh, and they, um, the only kind they had there, at least that I saw, was what they call their uh, Aran wool. And I did purchase a hank of their three ply Aran wool. The color is um, raspberry flat. Now, as you can tell, probably from my surroundings, is that I'm a huge fan of red. So of course, if I was gonna get one Hank, it was gonna be the red one. Uh, but I think this is really quite pretty. It's got uh, little bits of uh, yellow and blue, and, and there's quite a lot of dimension to it. Um, it's definitely very woolly wool. Uh, and uh, I looked online to find out what wool it's made with, and it's, they describe it as a mixture of both Irish wool and lowland wool. And, and lowland wool wasn't actually a term I was familiar with. I looked it up in sort of the Bible of fiber, the fleece and fiber source book, um, and there was no entry under lowland wool, but, um, I looked in Carol Feller's Contemporary Irish Knits and she explains that it's a mixture of Irish wool and New Zealand wool. So there you have it. Uh, the staff in this outlet were very nice and did their best to help me. Um, but since their market was mainly for you know, your sort of typical um, Tourist, you know, not a, a yarny like me, you know, they, they didn't really have much they could share about the spinning process or, you know, how, where the, the wool came from and so forth. But I am relatively confident that had I gone to the flagship in Killarney that there were probably, um, there's probably a lot uh, more to look at. Uh, you know, I visited another uh, sort of what I, you know, you think of a, a woolen shop. So these are shops that are, you know, geared towards the tourist market. This one was called uh, Comedum and it specialized in wool items uh, made by local artisans. Um, and they also sold cones of uh, Aran 
weight yarn from both Carrie Woolen Mills as well as uh, Studio Donegal. Uh, um, interestingly, um, I saw uh, uh, cable knit sweaters for sale uh, that were made from merino. So, you know, I guess they, they know their market and they might pick up, uh, you know, you know, someone who's going to Ireland and is not familiar with Irish wool might pick up a sweater knit from this stuff and be like, oh, that's that's a bit scratchy. So I can understand why they would also have merino wool sweaters for sale. We stopped to take this picture on our drive along the Ring of Kerry. Such amazing scenery. At the ruin of the Priory of Ballinskelligs, we saw these little stone grave markers, the smaller ones, which are actually graves of those who succumbed to the famine in the 1840s. We had uncharacteristically great weather out for a boat ride to the Skelligs to see the nesting gannets flying around and other sea life, like the sea lions and seals, basking in the sun, enjoying the day. My husband was able to take great pictures of the puffins in the water since we couldn't go on land to see them. Almost everywhere we went along the Wild Atlantic Way, we'd see these clumps of little pink flowers, sometimes in baby pink, sometimes with more of a fuchsia tone. They are called sea pinks, and they like to hang out on the edge of cliffs and rocks near the ocean. So this actually is a public bathroom we found in Port McGee, a quite conveniently located. But I point it out because it came second in Ireland's Top Toilet Award in 2002. Have you ever heard of such a thing? This is Glenanagh Castle in County Clare near Ballyvon, where we happen to be staying. The castle was in these cows' cow pasture. We were kind of curious about what we were doing there. We saw a lot of cows in Clare. Uh, these were crossing the road to go get milk. If you're in this part of Ireland, you gotta make a stop to see the cliffs of Moor. So I may have mentioned this already, but one of the reasons why 
I like to knit while we're on hikes is because my husband's a landscape photographer and sometimes I need something to do while uh, he is setting up to take his photographs. But also he tends to like to set himself up a little too close for my comfort and near a cliff and while I really doubt that he's in any danger, it does calm me down to have something on my needles. Another case in point here, he's set himself up to take a photograph on Valentia Island. And a few yards away, I am working on my sock. I thought it might be worth it to tell you a little bit about my hiking knitting setup. Uh, the most important thing you see there is actually the, the folding seat. Uh, it's a fairly inexpensive seat I picked up on Amazon for 10 bucks. I believe the brand is Coleman, but it enables me to have a sit and knit uh, without having to worry about um, you know, sitting in the sheep poo, which is all over the place. You just kind of get used to it in Ireland that everywhere you go, there's sheep and sheep droppings. It's just how it is. Um, in my lap, I have a project bag um, with my socks, um, and it fits nice and neatly in my uh, backpack, which you can't see there, but, you know, small project with small needles. Uh, the most important thing I'll say is my reading glasses, because <laughs> when you're a knitter of a certain age, uh, those are always in a project bag. And now it's show and tell time. I have a few things to share with you. Uh, so first I want to show you the finished socks I made while I was in Ireland. Uh, this is um, Andrea Mowry's pattern, um, the DRK Everyday Socks, and I knit them in La Bienaimee's Merino Super Sock. Uh, so it's just an easy sock pattern, uh, toe up, which I really like, uh, ribbing with a flegal heel. Uh, so um, now you saw what I was knitting on um, from that earlier clip. Another FO I have for you is some hand spun. So as a new spinner, uh, I found the School of Sweet Georgia's online spinning classes to be extremely helpful. Uh, and they're affiliated with Sweet Georgia Yarns, which also has hand dyed fiber for sale. So I ordered some of their Targi, and I was actually unfamiliar with Targi wool. It's an American wool um, before, but I really, really like it. It's quite like squishy and it's very soft to the touch. Um, and for this spin, I was going for consistency and to try and spin something more in the fingering or sport weight range. Uh, the color is called, uh, I think it's called spring fling. And so um, it is chain plied. So it should be kind of stripey. I am hoping to make it into a hat. So now you've heard about two hats I have in my future, but uh, I really feel at least with um, this spin, I feel like I'm kind of getting it. You know, it's, it's, this wasn't that frustrating to do, which was really um, encouraging for me. Uh, do you spin? Um, are you spinning curious? Uh, if you do spin, tell me what's been the most helpful resource to you as you've been trying to pick up your skills. I'm, I'm always trying to find out the best sources of where I can, you know, learn how to get the hang of spinning better. Uh, so works in progress. Um, I am still working on my curio socks, also an Andrea Maori pattern. Um, toe up again. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't figured it out, I am somewhat of an Andrea Maori fangirl. Uh, second pair of socks of hers. I've got the 
night shift here behind me. Um, so uh, this is the Curio, as I said, and I'm making it out of the hedgehog fibers, um, a sock yarn, I got those singles. And um, the heel is an afterthought heel, which means that you sort of knit the tube of the sock, and then when that's done, um, you you sort of you leave you go to the point where the heel is supposed to be and then you put the heel in so i'm kind of got this much done of the socks now i've been playing a little bit of yarn chicken and because i was nervous that i might run out of yarn for two socks i decided to make sort of the the cast off of the cuff and the heel out of some deep stash uh wool yarn i i, I have I know this is sock yarn. I don't remember what this is. I think it's some kind of German sock yarn. I got it well over 20 years ago. So, anywho, that's the socks. And of course, there is my Kurdok cardigan. I have made quite a bit of headway since the last episode. I kind of now have a, a bolero. It's a cable knit bolero, uh, but eventually there will be um, sleeves and a um, and it'll be longer. I, I did try it on the other day, and it definitely feels like it's going to fit. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, it's been so much fun to knit. I really have been enjoying all of these cables. So. If you're a knitter and you've knit uh, cables, I'm, I'm, I have a question for you. Are you a cable needle person? I am a cable needle person. Now I know that some people have taught themselves how to cable without using a cable needle, but I have been a bit trepidatious about doing that. I know the benefit is that it's supposed to be faster and easier, but I'm just worried that I'm going to drop stitches or mess things up somehow. Um, so are you team cable needle or are you team no cable needle? Comment below. In truth, um, uh, with this yarn, if you do mess up, um, this is, you know, really nice sticky wool. So um, in times where I've had to make corrections or rip back or ladder down to, to correct a stitch, it's been really nice that um, the yarn kind of really holds, stays in place. So uh, this is great yarn to knit with in that regard. So we've come to the end of the show. Um, thank you for watching my second episode. I, um, I am so grateful for all of my viewers and I'd really love it if you left a comment about what you're thinking of what I'm showing so far. So uh, please feel free to tell me what you like, um, tell me about the things that you'd like to see going forward. Uh, I would really find that helpful. And of course, um, please do like and subscribe. Uh, you won't wanna miss my next episode, which is going to be uh, the last in the series about Ireland.